to another episode of We Did That Shit Podcast, where we talk about who did some shit, what we learned from shit, and how we got through some shit. Maya's not here this week, y'all. And I'm Babi. Podcast family, we appreciate you. And I'm not just saying that. We really do appreciate you. We appreciate every listen, every like, every subscription, every comment, everything. We appreciate you listening and we hope your week was the shit. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome. If you enjoy our company or this week my company, don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, and Anchor. Pretty much anywhere you can listen to a free podcast. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at We Did That Shit. Maya's not here, podcast family. So how was your week? You know, if something happened that week, you know somebody or something who did some shit, your kids did something funny, something happened at work, you're making progress on a personal goal, you just came back from a great vacation and you want to brag, or somebody pissed you off and you held it together, let us know. Hit us up on social media. As for my week, you know, I've been mostly talking about my job, but I'm not going to talk about that this week. I still have a job. The job is still the same, but I'm changing. So like I always say, same shit, different me. So there are quite a few of who did some shits this week. And I'm going to save most of them for when Maya comes back because I know she has an opinion. So since I'm so nice, I'm going to talk about all nice things on who did some shit. The first thing is, it's still Autism Awareness Week. Today is April 29th. April is Autism Awareness Month, the entire month, excuse me, and... I just want to tell you a funny thing that my son did yesterday in the supermarket. So my son has, um, he's 25 years old and he does have all the skills necessary for independent living. So we are working on fine tuning a lot of things so that he can successfully live independently, which he pretty much does is just that because I'm hardly ever home, but you know, when he's in his own place, eventually, uh, he'll be able to handle all things that he needs to. So the mastering skill is his weekly grocery shopping. I had to get him to do his grocery shopping because as long as you do anything for him, he will continue to let you do it. He won't do it himself. Um, It's been times where I've had to starve him out. He was down to like his last grain of white rice before he agreed to go to the market and do the shopping. Um, So this is like the third week in a row that Xavier has gotten up, gotten dressed and says, okay, I'm ready to go to the market. He knows his weekly food budget and he goes, he pushes his own cart and he's scanning his own groceries and everything. So yesterday we're in the market and we went to the Walmart superstore because Some of the things that he eats are very specific, their name brand, and Walmart just has the cheaper prices. So my aunt lives with us and Jiggy was getting his snack. And this was like the last thing that we were picking up. And he likes Tostitos corn chips. So I said, oh, wow, I didn't bring my phone because it was at home charging. And... I said, I should call auntie and see if she wants something, but I don't have my phone. So Jiggy says, oh, I have no, I have my phone. And I'm like, oh, cool. I have her number. Cool. So this is another skill. We're not trying to master it yet, but it's another skill and it's considering others. So Jiggy pulls out his phone 
he scrolls through his contacts, he dials her number, and he says, Hi, I'm in the I I'm in the supermarket in the aisle where I get my Tostitos. Is there anything you want from this aisle? <laughs> oh my goodness, it was so funny to me because what he was saying is I'm already finished my shopping. I'm not going back around the store for anything you really want. But if you want a snack, I'll pick it up for you. And my aunt thought it was funny. And I almost peed myself in the Walmart. It was hilarious. But that's just my jig. I love you, jig. And that's why I have, if you listen to us on YouTube, I have the autism, always unique, totally intelligent, sometimes mysterious photo up. So my jig did that shit and he did do his shopping and he did bag his own groceries and he puts his own groceries in the car and puts them away and all that stuff. So who else? Oh, Principal Carlotta Outley Brown, who must be my aunt and I just don't know her. But she is the principal at the James Madison High School in Houston, Texas. And she recently put in a dress code for parents who visit the school. Yay, her. So it all started with one parent. I think her name was Jocelyn Lewis. She was coming up to the high school to take care of something for her student, her child. And she was denied entry into the school because she had on a head wrap and a short t-shirt dress. So Principal Outley Brown has implemented rules for parents. They cannot come to the school with satin caps, bonnets, shower caps, hair rollers, pajamas, torn jeans showing too much skin, uncovered leggings, low cut tops, sagging pants, undershirts, shorts, and anything with your butt hanging out. And of course, parents, some parents are upset and some parents are saying kudos to you. The principal says that your parents are your first example, you know, what happens at home. And of course, the parents who are objecting, they're saying like the school is a failing district. You have more important things to worry about. I'm just going to put it out there and say, uh, maybe the school is failing because the parents are failing their children. I always say it all the time. Parent is a verb. It's not just a noun. It's a verb. You have to do things as a parent. You have to raise children and children reflect their parents. So if you don't want your children out here acting wild, crazy, failing in school, doing things, then you have to show them a better way. So that's that. For Principal Carlotta Outley Brown, kudos to you. Make these parents act right. Who else? Oh, Mr. Rodney Robinson. Mr. Rodney Robinson is the National Teacher of the Year. Kudos to him. I mean, he's, and this National Teacher of the Year is a big thing because they go, they it's selected from... I think it's almost like 60 candidates. So it's every teacher of the year from every state. Also the American territories, which include Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, U.S. Virgin Islands, and also the Department of Defense Education Centers. So this is a really big deal. And Rodney Robinson teaches at the, and I don't know if it's Vergi or Vergi, the Vergi Benford Education Center. And it's a school that's located inside the Richmond Juvenile Detention Center in, Rich, in Richmond, Virginia. And he was born and raised in Richmond. He said he became a teacher because of his mother. His mother grew up in segregation and was too poor to finish high school. He says that he remembers after 
football practice, going to night school with his mom, waiting for a ride home while she earned her GED. And he was very proud of her. And she always said that education was very important. And Mr. Robinson has been a teacher for 20 years. And he just started teaching at the Vergy Benford School in 2015 when he wanted to have a better understanding of the school to prison pipeline, which is also something that we are going to discuss on the podcast. So he says, out of all things, that he wants people to understand the importance of culturally competent educators and recruiting teachers who look like his students and represent them and his culture. So kudos to you, Mr. Rodney Robinson, for teaching the children. Who's next? Oh, this is something I can definitely, definitely, definitely get behind. Um, I think it's the most recent episode of Tackless Knows It All podcast. Shout out to Ty and Mia. It was a very, very, very good discussion about faith and religion. And uh, we agree that I'm a very spiritual person as well. I'm very spiritual, but I'm not religious at all. And most of my objection to religiosity is that I really don't feel like the church represents what God really wants wants Christians to represent. But there is a church in San Francisco and the church is called St. Boniface Church. And for the last 15 years, every weekday, starting at 6 a.m., the church opens their doors to what they call their unhoused neighbors. And literally, they allow the homeless to come in They give them blankets. They stretch out on the pews and sleep. They even have service while the homeless are still there sleeping. They just continue church business as usual. And the unhoused neighbors are allowed to come in and out, take a nap, use the bathroom all day, all week. So if you are familiar with unhoused people, usually the shelters, which... You know, you you usually can't even walk in and out of a shelter. You have to get a referral to get into the shelter. The shelter is open. Usually in my neighborhood, it's open from 8 p.m. And you have to be out by 8 a.m. You have to take everything you belong that belongs to you with you. You can't um, keep things there or anything. You can take a shower. They don't serve meals. And then you have to be out all day, regardless of the elements. And then it opens back up the next day at 8 p.m. So to have somewhere to go for some people who do literally sleep on the street and they have a place to go to protect them from the elements so they can sleep. Um, They can also enjoy the service. There's area food banks around where people get food and some people panhandle or beg. I just thought it was a great gesture. And it's important to note that This program has been going on for 15 years. They don't make anybody sign in and out. There's no forms to be filled out, no bureaucracy, nothing. It's just a safe place to come and sleep if you need rest. Now, when I read this, my heart was just overfilled with joy. And then I just started thinking about today, I know where I live, people will be like, well... We got to ask this person, that person. We have to have security. Oh, we need a sign-in sheet. Oh, what about this? What about that? It just seems like people just have any excuse not to help. And that is not Christ-like. So kudos to you, St. Boniface Church, who allows their unhoused neighbors to come in and get rest. I really like that story. So today... There's a lot of things I wanted to talk about, but I said I had to wait because I know Maya also wants to talk about those subjects. So I decided to make this episode more like a personal journal, but with a real story. So everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of people, which I still like, are still talking about 
Nipsey Hussle and his contributions to his community. And most recently, the rapper Jay-Z paid tribute to Nipsey um, in a freestyle rap at one of his concerts. Now, I'm not going to get into that because, you know, I'm not a hip hop head like that. I'm more of an old school hip hop kind of gal. I do know that I know a Jay-Z song, but unless my daughter tells me or somebody says what it is, like, yeah, I don't know. I can't just say, oh, you know, Jay-Z who sings because I don't know. But anyway, I do know that he paid tribute with a freestyle rap to Nipsey um, talking about how we should buy up and contribute to our own neighborhood before gentrification comes in. And for those of you who are confused as to what Nipsey Hussle was doing, that is what he was doing. He was investing in his neighborhood. And I thought that was great. And also, one of my Facebook friends very recently said that he posted that he needed a certain amount of money to be able to be a full-time activist. And then another certain amount of money, I think it was like $10 million, to be a philanthropist. And I responded to that saying, you know, you don't need... $10 $10 million to be a philanthropist. Everyone has something and they have something to contribute. And it may not seem like you have much and it may not seem like you're doing much. However, if you give what you have, you are doing something. And in my eyes, it makes you a philanthropist. So one of the things that I talk about my job a lot, and I do love my job, even though it's mad stressful now, but I've been working in HIV and AIDS since, well, I started volunteering in 1989, but I got my first paying job in 1998. And I remember uh, interviewing for the job. And I remember say, after I went on the interview, I was like, oh my gosh, what they do for people is amazing. You know, I didn't know that I could be getting paid for the stuff that I love volunteering for. You know, this is great. And I, I said I had made up in my mind that if they called me for a second interview, like I was going to get this job. I didn't know how much it paid. It didn't matter. I wanted to work here. I wanted to be a part of this great cause. And they did call me for the second interview and I did get the job. And I was very excited. And I started the job in November. And in November, it's, you know, we're getting ready for Thanksgiving, which is one of my favorite holidays. And for Thanksgiving, all of the families, the clients of the organization get adopted out. So volunteers will make baskets and they make Thanksgiving baskets with all kinds of stuff that a family would need to have a nice holiday. So I think it's like the client list. It says it's if it's a one parent or two parent household, how many children, the ages and the genders of the children. And then a volunteer would say, well, I want two, cho- I want two families. I want one family. I want this. I want that. And They would go out and, you know, because of privacy issues, of course, they would do whatever, they would pick up whatever they wanted for the family and then drop the baskets off or the gifts or whatever it was, baskets, boxes, trunks, all kinds of things. And they would drop it off to our office. And then we had another set of volunteers, mostly people who worked there, who would deliver said stuff. And I remember I worked in the front at the time. And I just was like, oh, wow, this is so nice. Look at all this stuff. Okay. And I would check things in and people would just come drop it off and say bye. And vans will pull up because churches would adopt like 10 families. And, you know, it was just amazing. And I remember all the people who were dropping things off were white. And I just, you know, another drop off, another drop off, another drop off. And they were white. And our clients that used our services, 
we were about 60, 70 percent minority, either African American or Hispanic. And there was none of us coming to volunteer. And that bothered me. It bothered me a lot. So um, I also got this job in November, the actual same month my mother transitioned. And um, so I didn't do much that year. But I remember the next year I said, you know, this is unacceptable. And I reached out to my church and other people that I knew because I believe that we should help take care of our own. This is something that I've always believed. I don't know. Both my parents are very charitable. And people think that black people don't volunteer, that we don't give, that we don't care. And that is not the case. Now, sometimes we don't always know what's going on and how to help, but we do do things. So I started to get very involved with helping our community help ourselves. And that's how uh, my organization was birthed. It's called the AIDS Interfaith Ministry. But now I just call it AIM because, you know, there's such a stigma still attached to AIDS. And I started going to churches to make them aware that this is an issue in our community and there are things that they can do to help and here's how. So AIM started in, I want to say 2000. I was incorporated in 2000. And so one of the things that I have done since then is every time I get paid, I put a little bit of money away. Um, when you work, I'm a nurse, so when you work in human services, social services, civil services, emergency response, health care, you come in contact with a lot of people who have a lot of specific needs. And there are people who are, they may be housed, but they're hungry. Uh, they may have food and shelter, but they have no transportation to get to quality medical care or their children to school. Or, you know, they don't have a way to get their child a new pair of shoes when they actually need them. So the child is wearing shoes that are two sizes too small for two months until they can get some money to get the baby another pair of shoes. But there are unique needs that come up in everyday work. And if you have friends or if you yourself are a person that works at maybe like the county welfare or the fire department or um, any type of human services, social services, health care, you, I'm sure, have come in contact with such people. And one of the things that I wanted to do is regardless of my personal financial state at the time, because, hey, we all have it. I don't always have it. You know, sometimes things come up and my extra money has to go to take care of that thing. Um, but when if I get paid, every time I get paid, I put a certain percentage away so that if a need arises and I know about it, then there is something that I can do to help. And over the years, thank the Lord, you know, my pay has increased and I'm able to give more. So there are certain organizations that my organization, through me, supports on a regular basis. Um, most of them are based in my hometown because charity does begin at home. And I give to them on a regular basis for them to keep up their mission. And my point is, that's where philanthropy begins. And that's how we collectively, even if we don't have, because I don't have Jay-Z and Beyonce money. I mean, I know I look like a million dollars, but um, I ain't got it. So, but that's where little by little, together, we can service our own community and take care of our own community. And if people would learn that are like-minded, could learn to get together, maybe by myself, I won't be able to purchase a property, but collectively 
we can purchase a property and start building our own community. So that's something that has always been very dear to me, very close to me, and something that I hope to always continue. In my organization now, I have something called the, uh, you could be a CEO. I have other colleagues that work in the different sectors that I mentioned. And now they, every time they get paid, they will donate to my organization. Sometimes a set number, sometimes it's what they can give on that particular pay, but they know if they come across a client or someone that they're interacting with who is in need, a portion of the money that they give can be used to help that person. And I call it CEO because it's charitable endowment owner. So it's your account. 25% of the donation stays with the AIDS Interfaith Ministry or AIM. And the other 75% is just saved for that person to use however they like. So if you have a social worker who works in domestic violence and on this time, this client says, I don't want to deal with it anymore. He's out of the house. I want to change the locks, and but I don't have money to. If that person calls and say, hey, I need a locksmith to change the locks at this place, and they've contributed into their endowment account, then I can send a locksmith over there to change the locks. Or if the holidays are coming and someone is applying for welfare and they have nothing, or God forbid there's a fire and someone has a CEO account with my organization and they say, look, I need to go to ShopRite and buy groceries for this family who's just been burned out of their house. Well, then I can go get food cards for ShopRite and they can go shopping for the family. So even if you don't have a lot of money, and of course, especially around holiday times, we don't have a lot of money to spare. If you're continually giving little by little on a regular basis, you too can help somebody who's in need. And that about sums it up for the podcast this week. Hopefully Maya had a great time on her trip. I know she has a lot of Instagram stories up. And we will be back next week with another new episode of the We Did That Shit podcast. Remember that you can listen to the podcast on anywhere you can listen to podcasts for free. We're on all the iTunes, Google Play, Anchor, YouTube, and Spotify. You can also follow us on all social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you might want to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we're doing new things. Like this week, you can see me while I'm doing the podcast. Um, we are at We Did That Shit. And on YouTube, it's We Did That Shit Podcast. You can also follow us on our personal Twitter account. Maya is We Did That Shit Maya. And she's at my my 13 That's M-Y-M-Y-1-3. And I'm at the Diamina. That's B I B B I A M I N A. So remember, be great this week. Give a little. Do that shit. And wherever you are, cousin, I love you.